manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. As you may have seen in the chat, the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, along with our partner Mentor Cloud, is launching a major movement called Mentor Makers. And our aim is to have 1 million mentor hours banked by 50,000 mentors in support of entrepreneurs. We ask you to take a moment to tag one or more mentors on social media who have helped you along the way and challenge a colleague or friend to do the same. Just use hashtag tag a mentor and hashtag mentor makers in the post and tag us at NASDAQ Center. Be sure to include a photo or video to win the chance for you or your mentor to be featured on the NASDAQ Tower in Times Square. None of what we could do, none of what we do could be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, NZTE, and Microsoft for Startups. We're humbled by all of their contributions. During these unique times, we're curious to learn how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs we work with. So we'd like to start by taking a poll to let us know how you're feeling about your business right now. So I'm gonna launch this. Start us off, how are you feeling? 2020 has been an interesting year. Are you fearful, anxious, surviving, or optimistic? And then up next, what's keeping you up at night? We use this data to help inform the real-time solutions and programming for our entrepreneurs. So thank you. The responses are flying in. Looks like at the top of the key, we've got surviving and optimistic. Good that fearful isn't in there uh, that much, but uh, it is an interesting year for all of us. And it looks like finance and sales are on the leaderboard for our What's Keeping You Up at Night. So I'm gonna end this poll and share the results really quickly with you all. So thank you so much for answering those. Looks like optimistic and finance are our leaders, which is great because that's part of the topic of discussion for today. Without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our moderator for the, this panel today, Jeff Thomas, Senior Vice President and Head of Western US Listings and Capital Markets at NASDAQ and the President of our board here at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Jeff, over to you. Thanks, Colin. Uh, as Colin mentioned, 2020 has been an unprecedented year on so many different fronts uh, and the public markets are no exception. Uh, entrepreneurs and founders now have a variety of new ways to take their companies to the public markets so that they can raise capital and provide liquidity to fuel their company's growth. We've assembled an all-star lineup of presenters today to talk you through all of the different considerations when thinking about going and entering the public markets via SPAC or a special purpose acquisition company, which is a unique process that's gained a lot of traction this year in 2020. So before I move on to introduce our panelists, I do wanna get a pulse from the audience here and just see how many of you are considering accessing the public markets? And if so, what is the method that you're looking at? Are you thinking about an initial public offering? Are you thinking about a direct listing? Or are you thinking about doing a SPAC business combination? Or like many entrepreneurs today, are you looking at all of the above? So we'll take a minute to let those enter in. And of course, during the program today, we're going to go through and look at some of the trade-offs between these different options and some of the data for the, the market tells us about what could be right for your company. Fantastic. Looks like 46% uh, came back and said that they're looking at all options. 34%, not surprisingly, are looking at a SPAC business combination. Probably a good reason to join today. With IPOs coming in at 18% and only 2% looking at direct listings. And it's interesting as while direct listings get a lot of uh, press coverage because some high profile companies have used that, there are still relatively few in the market. So it does line up with what we see in the market. Well, before I dive into some of the um, prepared topics today, uh, I do wanna go through and introduce all the different members of our panel and give them a chance to tell you about their backgrounds. So Mark, do you wanna kick off? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Jeff. I'm Mark Baudler. I'm a partner at Wilson Sonsini in Palo Alto and San Francisco, and I'm in the corporate and securities law practice there. 
Fantastic. And Sherry? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sherry Major. I'm a partner in KPMG's deal advisory practice based in Silicon Valley. Um, I work with companies on IPOs and SPAC transactions, including on the buy side and sell side, focused on helping through the accounting and reporting implications of these transactions. But more broadly, KPMG helps throughout the entire deal spectrum, whether it's helping a SPAC to go public, helping on the diligence of a target, helping with the filing requirements or ongoing life as a public company. So really happy to be here with you today and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Sherry. And Priya? Hi, Jeff. Um, good to be here. I am Priya Huskins. I'm a partner at Woodruff Sawyer. Woodruff Sawyer is a full service commercial insurance brokerage headquartered in sunny San Francisco, servicing clients worldwide. We broker all lines of commercial insurance, including employee benefits. I chair Woodruff Sawyer's DNO claims group. And so within my portfolio of responsibility, I get to interact with companies doing IPOs, direct listings, and SPACs. Looking forward to having the discussion today. Fantastic. Well, now that we've met our panelists, I was going to kick off with a little bit of data to show you how uh, important the topic of SPACs are these days. So as you can see here on the screen, at NASDAQ, we've had over $50 billion in SPAC IPO proceeds raised since 2010. And as you can see, that number is accelerating at a dramatic pace. So let's start with a quick definition. What is a SPAC? A SPAC is a publicly listed vehicle that raises capital from investors. The sponsor of that SPAC or the managers of that SPAC go out and they search out a company to acquire. Typically a SPAC will look to acquire a company that's about three times the size of the SPAC. So if you look at some of the names on the left there, Connex Corporation would be looking for a company that might be in the three to $4 billion range. SPACs can also raise additional capital as they're looking for a target acquisition through a pipe or a private investment in a public entity to help fund even larger acquisitions. So when you look at some of the data in terms of those business combinations, we can see that those are accelerating too. So as there's more SPACs in the market looking for targets, you can see the number of business combinations have not been only growing in number, but also in size. Earlier this year, we saw DraftKings go public via an acquisition by the Diamond Eagle Acquisition Corp. And they came out and their market value is currently over $10 billion. Velodyne LiDAR, a leading uh, company in the LiDAR space that fuels autonomous driving, recently came public on NASDAQ after merging with Graph Industrial Corp. And that company is valued at over a billion dollars. And just recently, Gore's Holdings announced the largest ever SPAC business combination of United Wholesale Mortgage, and they're targeting an enterprise value of over $16 billion. So you can see that these are major companies that are looking to come to market via SPAC business combination route. Now I was gonna turn it over to Mark to walk us through some of the typical timelines that we see when a SPAC identifies a target. Oh, thank you, Jeff. And I, I will preface this by saying that um, different companies are in different situations when they consider a potential SPAC transaction. And, and, and I think that is worth bearing in mind. Uh, I, I go back to the survey uh, that was taken at the beginning of this discussion and how many different routes uh, people are looking at uh, to potentially access the, the public markets. Um, some companies are in the situation where they, they are evaluating um, potentially going public through a, a traditional IPO or even a direct listing, um, as well as a SPAC. And other companies are, are in a different situation when a traditional IPO or a direct listing isn't necessarily uh, a possibility that they're considering. And that can impact the, the timeline. Um, and even in the situation where companies are, are looking at SPACs um, for, for financing coupled with the pipe investment, uh, those companies can be in dramatically different situations as well. There can be uh, situations where um, they are, are raising a relatively small amount of money compared to the overall uh, market cap of the company. 
I am working with one company currently that, that fits into that uh, situation. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, I'm working with another company where the SPAC transaction together with the pipe investment is going to be a majority uh, stake in the post-business combination company. And, and I mentioned that at the outset because all of these factors can, can impact the timing. And, and, and also to show just the great variety in companies that are thinking about SPACs as potential investment vehicles. Uh, in terms of the overall timeline, um, generally speaking from the time uh, the LOI is signed until uh, the business combination agreement and the subscription agreements for the pipe transactions it is probably in the four to six week uh, category. And some of that depends on how prepared a company is to not so much negotiate the business combination agreement, but to have meetings with the pipe investors and get those lined up. That is, uh, those two transactions happen at the same time. And then after that, and, and we can talk about this a little bit more, uh, it's primarily an execution um, exercise to get to closing. Uh, you have to file a, a proxy statement, oftentimes that's coupled with a registration statement. And you have to go through the SEC process just like you would for a direct listing or for a traditional IPO. And in my recent experience, at least, that's usually a you know, three month period between signing um, the merger agreement and the subscription agreements for the pipe and getting to the point uh, when that business transaction closes. And that's subject to a number of factors, how ready a company is to uh, file the, the proxy statement with the necessary um, financial statements to the review process with the SEC. One thing that I will say at the outset, and I work primarily on the company and entrepreneur side of, of these transactions, both in terms of SPAC transactions, but also uh, traditional IPOs or uh, with direct listings. Um, companies that are considering SPAC transactions often differ um, from traditional IPO candidates in that they're not necessarily gearing up you know, to be a public company. And so the companies that we work with that are gearing up to be a public company usually start that gearing up process in terms of uh, investments that they make in, in G&A, in the finance department, in the legal department, about a year before the IPO process kicks off. What we're seeing with a number of the companies that we work with is that you know, they're almost starting from a dead start. And that means uh, working with you know, folks like Sherry um, in terms of getting the financial statements in, in good order. And some companies have audited financial statements. They're not at the public company standards that would be required uh, for, for the filings in this. But we have other companies that really haven't gone through the audit process at all. And so there's a number of, of different considerations that can impact the timing. I'll take a breath here, Jeff, and see if, if you have any follow-up questions or if anybody wants to get into more detail. No, I think that's a great overview. And I think I'll go ahead and stop sharing the timeline now so we can jump into some of the Q&A uh, with the panelists. And so Sherry, Mark had talked a little bit about the fact that some of these companies that are being approached by SPACs maybe weren't on the IPO track already. How should companies think about preparing those financial statements so that when they get to be a public company, they can meet all the requirements? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's certainly a fair amount of effort that goes into getting financial statements ready for a public, you know, registration and, and SEC scrutiny. And so, you know, there are hurdles around just getting through, you know, public company reporting requirements reflected in the financial statement. So, you know, as Mark mentioned, sometimes companies haven't had an audit before. Sometimes they have had audits, but under private company standards. So there's a, a, an amount of effort to be done to make sure that you know, public company reporting requirements are reflected in the financial statements and that you've been through a, a PCAOB audit. So there's a difference between an AICPA audit, which is for private companies and PCAOB for public. So there's additional work, you know, on the part of the company, but also on the part of the auditors. So that, you know, if it hasn't been started yet by the time a target is being looked at by a SPAC, that can take, you know, a significant amount of effort and certainly impact the timeline. And so there's typically a number of you know, interesting issues that come up as well. So never mind just the historical financial statements for the company, but just requirements around the transaction. And so 
We see companies dealing with some interesting, you know, equity um, issues that need to be reflected properly in the financials. And one of the key items that comes up in these SPAC transaction is, you know, who is the accounting acquirer? So not to get too deep into some, you know, technical accounting guidance here, but it really does impact what goes into the S4 registration statement as who ultimately is deemed, you know, the acquirer, whether it's the SPAC or the target, because it can vary to pace based on you know, the structure of the transaction. So it's certainly there's a number of issues to be vetted you know, with the audit team so that you can get in front of that as the company preparing. And then just thinking about sort of down the road. So there's a mad rush obviously to, to get through the transaction in a fast timeline. And like Mark mentioned, if you're, you've been gearing up for an IPO, you've maybe been on the path for about a year thinking about that infrastructure. If you haven't thought about it yet, there's not really gonna be a lot of time to think longer term during the, the transaction timeline. And so a lot of that gets put a little bit later to thinking about how am I going to maintain these public company processes on an ongoing basis? Do I need to staff up and you know, bring on more expertise within the accounting function? How am I going to close the books um, and actually report under SEC timelines? So a number of things to think about. Um, so you know, certainly don't want to underestimate the, the level of effort um, involved, but um, certainly an exciting time for companies as well. And Priya, outside of all the, the hard work, there also comes some risk, right? So what should uh, companies that are thinking about uh, doing a business combination with a SPAC be thinking about in terms of you know, the, the liability that they'll be taking on as a publicly traded company? Um, so I think you're going to get a theme here, which is companies that are looking to go public through a SPAC will be differently positioned at the starting line in terms of being ready for public company scrutiny. And some companies were, you know, kind of triple tracking, I guess is what we're calling it. They're ready. They're ready to go. You know, they've done their warm ups. They've done their wind sprints. They've got their shoes tied on and they're, they're ready for the starter gun. Um, I, I'm a little more concerned about the folks that are still back on the sofa, beer in hand, feet up, get a great deal. And they're like, oh, wait, is it go time? Um, and I think that that spectrum can help you start thinking about the risk landscape. Um, so very specifically, once a company is publicly traded, there's no backseas or maybe a better word is forgiveness for, oh gosh, you went public really fast in unexpected circumstances. And what I mean by that is if you're not ready for public company scrutiny, um, you're in for a not very good time because once you're out there, and of course the SPACs have, um, there's more disclosure going out compared to a traditional IPO. What that really means is that the plaintiff's bar has more fodder for its ultimate um, litigate for their ultimate litigation efforts. And so what I'm talking about are both traditional stock drop suits that are brought against the boards of these now public companies alleging um, material misstatements and omissions in their public statements. I'm also talking about breach of fiduciary duty suits that can be brought again by the now shareholders of your publicly traded company. And what all of that means is that as you're getting through the accounting issues and as you are with Sherry and as you're listening to Mark's Sage advice transactionally, um, here's a plug to listen to Mark's advice around things like corporate governance, because all of that will come into play in terms of what does the world look like for are you sued? And if you're sued, how fast can you make it go away? Hopefully for less money. So I am Captain Brendan at this party. I do apologize for that. <laughs> and Priya brought up a really interesting point, which is the level of disclosure is different between an IPO and a SPAC business combination. At its core, an IPO is a fundraising event where you're hiring an underwriter, you're selling that underwriter shares, and they're gonna distribute those out to investors. When you do that, you can talk to the investment bank's analysts to help them develop a model, but basically what you're gonna be disclosing is historical financial statements. In a SPAC business combination, it's a merger. And so if you're out doing a pipe or talking to investors about why they should invest in the combined company, you're of course gonna be providing forward-looking projections. And that's one of the big differences um, between an IPO and a SPAC business combination. Now, Mark, we're already starting to get some questions in the uh, Q&A here. 
Jeff, sorry. I'm sorry. Before you move on, I just do want, I do want to say one more thing about litigation. So I did focus on the company that will be public. I, I, in fairness to the audience, to give a complete picture, I do want to mention that there can be litigation that arises that actually challenges the transaction itself. Um, so some of it is just classic M&A litigation. It's all kind of annoying um, allegations about, you know, you should have, um, eat, both sides, right? The company should have gotten more money um, or the buyer is overpaying. And we are seeing both of those and they're really annoying. Um, but I also just want to remind you that there can be more pernicious types of litigation if it turns out um, there are undisclosed conflicts, there are sort of business arrangements, money transfers that we were surprised about, other kinds of conflicts. Um, we're seeing more noise about that in the system. And so just want to remind everyone that it's, a, you know, we're so excited you're doing a SPAC, but the normal rules around M&A and diligence and the documentation of that diligence in case of litigation still apply. So I just wanted to make sure I had mentioned that, Jeff. Thanks. Yeah, and it's a really good point, Priya, because I think, you know, even the SEC is starting to look at what are the sponsor's motivations, right? What are the, the compensation uh, aspects of being a, a SPAC? And I think there's a lot of, you know, really interesting questions that unfold out of that. And I'm sure we'll, we'll see it continue to develop. So Mark, um, as we kind of think about what types of companies are good candidates uh, to go public via a SPAC business combination versus an IPO, some of the questions we're seeing in the Q&A, can a pre-revenue company pursue this? Can a SPAC be used to kind of combine and roll up multiple targets? You know, how should the audience be thinking about this in terms of how big a company do you need to be to go public via a SPAC business combination? Yeah, and I don't think that there's just one answer to, to that question, Jeff. Um, I, I certainly think that there um, is a market uh, for SPAC transactions for certain, uh, not, not every pre-revenue company. Um, you know, a couple of the high profile uh, SPAC deals uh, from earlier this summer, um, some of them have closed, um, some of them are about to close, involve pre-revenue company at, at development stages. And uh, you know, we've had the pleasure of, of working on on one of them that that's just about to close. And um, so a, a SPAC transaction can be, you know, very interesting for a company like that. It, it enables a company to put a tremendous amount of money on its balance sheet through the SPAC transaction itself, uh, together with a pipe investment. It can put competitive distance uh, between other players in, in an industry. I, I don't think that every pre-revenue company uh, will be ready to, to, to be public, but certainly uh, you know, there are good candidates there. I, I, I think it's fair to say in the traditional IPO market, the you know, pre-revenue company or the development stage company, we haven't seen a, a lot of those IPOs over the last you know, 10 or even 20 years. Um, but I do think that uh, the, the SPAC transactions uh, will enable you know certain companies to to be able to evaluate this a, as a potential path forward. In terms of the roll-up strategy, I've had a discussion with you know a few companies and a few SPAC sponsors uh, about this, and I think it's possible. Um, one of the things that that I think about, and uh, you know Sherry might appreciate this, is depending on how it's structured, you you could get pretty complicated as part of a SPAC transaction if there's multiple operating companies that are being rolled up all at one time. Um, in, in terms of the pro forma financials, the historical financials, some of the issues that Sherry talked about just get multiplied when you're talking about uh, several companies being part of, of one transaction. What I, what I think might be a more, you know, executable strategy is to identify uh, a, a, an operating company or an operating company to identify the, the right SPAC um, and then to have a war chest, if you will, uh, to go roll up other industry participants after the SPAC transaction is, is completed. I mean, it's good to be mindful about some SEC rules about, you know, pending acquisitions and, and the like. And um, I'm sure whoever you're using uh, as, as corporate counsel can help walk you through that. Um, but it is it is a strategy, and um, you know it's fairly effective because you know you can you can put a lot of money on your balance sheet you know fairly quickly, and then you also have uh, you know publicly traded stock uh, that you can use as currency for acquisitions going forward. Um, Jeff, I, hopefully I've answered your question there. Absolutely, and Sherry, we're in a lot of questions in the Q and A as well about uh, 
Um, what are the financial disclosures um, that are needed in a SPAC transaction? You know, so for example, um, you, you talked a little bit about the audit. How many years of financial statements do you need when you go public? And um, talk a little bit about, you know, what's required on the disclosure side. Yeah, absolutely. So the number of historical years can vary. It will be, you know, either two or three years from a historical perspective. And that's going to be based on, you know, somewhat the size of the target, but also where the SPAC is in its life cycle, whether it's already reported a 10K, you know, or not. So, um, you know, two at a minimum, three potential. So it's good to be prepared for that and, and you know, work with your, your auditor on, on what will be required. So you'll have, you know, as the target, um, you'll have historical financial statements that are audited under PCOB standards. There will be pro forma information that show what the SPAC and the target look like combined. Um, and there will be some, you know, future looking sort of projection information that'll go into the uh, registration statement as well. So there's a fair amount of financial information. There will be management's discussion and analysis. So um, MDNA, for those of you who are familiar, that really talks about, you know, comparing the results of the target as well as, you know, what the combined company would, would look like. So there's a fair amount of financial information and disclosures that are required. And they are different from, you know, what a company might have historically disclosed as a, as a private company. So the SEC rules will, will dictate that. Um, and certainly there is an uplift uh, to be performed not only for you know, the combined organization, but even just to get the historical financial statements in compliance with the requirements. And Mark, you'd mentioned, um, you know, typically in an IPO, you're doing an S1. Sometimes you're using a different um, filing like an S4 for a SPAC business combination. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between those two filings? And Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. And then maybe I can touch on a couple of things uh, re related to the financial statements as well to keep in mind. Um, so when a company goes public through a traditional IPO, um, the, the registration statement that they use is, is an S-1 or if they're a foreign private issuer and an F-1. In, in the business combination uh, context, it, it is a, either an S-4 or for a foreign private issuer, an, an F-4. And I would think of the S-4 and the, the F-4 as a combination of a proxy statement to solicit the stockholder approval for the, the SPAC entity uh, together, you know, with with material information of, about the operating company that is akin to what you would see in, in an S one, and pre alluded to uh, there being more disclosure, and some of it is just the sheer volume of you know having the business combination aspect of it in in the filing, uh, together with with the S one type of disclosure. I think for liability purposes, um, what what Jeff mentioned earlier about having projected financial statements, both because of the, the business combination aspect of the transaction, but also uh, when, when companies are talking to the pipe investors, they're giving projected information. All of that gets filed publicly. Uh, it gets filed as part of an 8K when the business combination agreement is announced by the SPAC company. And then those same projections are in the, in the S4, the proxy statement. Um, and I'm using S4, just assuming that you have a domestic issuer. And, and that is unlike um, a traditional IPO company. A traditional IPO company will give um, projected financial um, statements to the analysts for the banks that are part of the syndicate. And then as part of the roadshow presentation, there is typically a, a slide about the long-term business model of those companies. But that is very different than having um, specific projected financial statements as part of the registration statement. And so care has to be given to what those pro projected financial statements are uh, that, you know, you, you don't want to be constantly in sell mode um, in, in terms of thinking about this. You want to be thinking that, you know, this is going to be a, you know, a document that's publicly available and the plaintiff's bar uh, will, will be taking a look at that if something goes bump in a night. Um, you want to give, you know, full disclosure about the assumptions that you're making and the risks associated with, with that to best protect yourself. One of the things, going back to the timeline that I do think about, um, and, and this is where I, I, I mentioned financial statements with Sherry, when you're going through a process that's three or four months, uh, you have to be mindful 
of when financial statements go stale as well. And so we're having a number of companies kind of go through this process currently where the timing is going to be such that their um, 930 numbers are likely to go stale in the middle of February and putting aside issues such as poss possibly getting um, exceptions or exemptions from the, the SEC. That's really important in, in, in terms of planning. And one of the things that I you know, would say is that depending on um, the structure of the transaction, whether it's the, the SPAC entity that's the surviving entity or the operating company that's the surviving entity, there, there is a lot of informal guidance from the SEC about how to treat, you know, these type of transactions in terms of financial statements that need to be filed and when and how to think about that. And so, you know, it really, you know, requires, um, you know, a fair amount of, of, of thinking uh, on the planning end at the beginning of this to be able to execute it well, to make sure that if you have to go talk to the SEC that you give yourself enough time to, to do that as part of this process, um, so you don't get caught off guard later. And, and there's just a number of, of technical issues to think about as well uh, when you're executing a SPAC transaction. So Priya, we've been talking a lot about the disclosure um, and some of the risk that creates um, how should the SPAC, different from the target company and the business combination, be thinking about director and officer insurance? Uh, as we know, rates there have been uh, skyrocketing lately. So what are, what are the differences? What are the trade-offs? And, and why is that insurance getting so expensive? So great question. Um, and what I'm hearing you say is talk about the SPAC itself and their IPO process. I'm happy to talk about the DSPAC insurance later. Um, you know, in addition to all the financial and legal complexity, well, it turns out insurance is a little complex for these transactions as well. Um, so starting with the SPAC, the, on the one hand, the, the SPAC, the sponsors, you know, they're putting together a shell. Um, we're not going to miss, you know, our quarter. There's no quarter, right? And so SPACs by their nature, the SPAC IPO, the insurance for it, it is less expensive than the insurance for an operating company IPO, and it should be. Um, so when you're going through that process, however, it is useful to identify who the broker will be sooner than later. And I urge you to work with an insurance broker who does this a lot. And the numbers I'm about to share are the reason, part of the reason why. So if, when I look at SPAC transactions that were happening earlier this year, it was pretty straightforward to get um, $10 million of DNO insurance at first 10 million for something like $250,000. That would have been over a million dollar deductible. And for most SPACs, so SPACs raising less than a billion dollars, we were probably, we, we were seeing, based on our recommendations, people buying about $20 million of DNO insurance for the IPO company, the SPAC that's doing its initial fundraising. And that costs something shy of $500,000. Again, over a million dollar deductible. I also want to point out that these are two year policies. It is an error, it is a mistake to do a one year policy for some structural reasons, including the fact that, hey, at the first renewal, if the SPAC hasn't bought anything, it's still there and it doesn't have more, it's not raising more money, right? So these are two year policies. The fact that it's a two-year policy creates a concern, though, in the insurance market or a concern really for you as a buyer. Not all DNO insurance carriers are able to issue a two-year policy. So you're already going from a robust market to a smaller market. And for those of us who remember Economics 101, that's going to be a problem, right? We're going to have a lot of demand and less supply. Um, we have observed, all of us, that there's actually been a ton of demand and the market has moved. So um, a deal that closed yesterday, that same first $10 million, $10 million of insurance, um, it wasn't $250,000, it was more than a million dollars. That is a huge movement in a very short amount of time. And I want to assure you that was the best deal on the table right? Because we generally go with the good carrier that will give us the best terms. Um, and so that tells you the other options in the market were more expensive. So that was the clearing price. Um, so right, so a forex change in a very short amount of time. In addition, that self-insured retention, like a deductible, it went from $1 million earlier than the, in the year to the deal I have in my head right now, and this is very typical, $5 million. So it 
quintupled. Um, and that reflects a couple of things. It's again, the supply and demand problem that I mentioned, but it also reflects the fact that insurance carriers are getting a little edgy. They're getting a little concerned. There are a lot of these, um, you know, in the interim, Jay Clayton of the SEC said, you know, hey, I'm looking, are we guys, are you guys doing some really good disclosure about what the incentive structure is for the sponsors? Is that very clear, right? So that's the SEC albeit generally quite supportive of SPACs, but indicating that they're skeptical. That tells me, as somebody who looks at these things for a living, they're looking for an example. So, you know, you want to make sure you've got that good disclosure. Um, and as the SEC is looking for an example, as there are a ton of these in the market, and as the DNO insurance market on a macro level is really suffering, the technical term is absolute dumpster fire, we are in a situation where if you need a willing counterparty as the SPAC to sell you the insurance, the price is going up, and I, can, I actually anticipate that it will continue to go up. The number of claims that are popping up being filed against the SPAC sponsors at the time of the DSPAC are also a problem. So technically there is S1 section 11 registration liability at the time the SPAC goes public. I've actually, and I've looked, I've seen zero pieces of litigation against that. That kind of makes sense. Um, but this issue of the SPAC being sued at the time of the DSPAC transaction is a problem for carriers, right? Because they're there to pay for those. Um, and the more of these DSPAC transactions we're seeing, we're also seeing, albeit largely really stupid, um, sorry, but generally really stupid complaints, those complaints are still costly. They still have to be defended and insurance carriers are not excited about that. Well, and I think that brings up another really good, good point and good question. And Mark, maybe I'll, I'll kick this one to you. What are the, the sponsor's responsibilities after the merger, right? So as we're talking about the risk and the liability, are the sponsors gonna be involved in the companies post-merger or are they gonna roll off and, and work on their next spec? Well, I, I think that depends a lot on, uh, on what, who the SPAC is and the relation to the operating company. I mentioned when we were talking about timelines that there are companies in very different positions from one another that are considering uh, these DSPAC transactions. And so, you know, just, just in terms of, of things that I am looking at, in, in, in the case where there is an operating company that is looking, you know, through the pipe and the SPAC to sell 10% of its company, in all likelihood, you're gonna have one director from uh, the SPAC on the combined company board going forward. It's just not gonna be a major factor in terms of uh, the operational direction of, of, of the company. In, in, in my other example, where through the pipe investment and the SPAC investment, they're going to own 75% uh, of the company roughly afterwards, you can expect um, the SPAC investors to have, you know, much more say in the direction of the company going forward. Uh, and, and that just makes sense economically. And then you, you have other situations that don't fall you know, so so heavily, you know, in one side or the other of the spectrum, you have more of the, you know, what you describe as the traditional SPAC to begin with. And in that case, you might have, you know, a couple people on the, the board of the combined company, you know, almost always it's the, um, it, it's the operating company management team uh, that continues on with, with the company afterwards. Sometimes you, you have to look at who that team is and are those the right people to, uh, be management at the company um, as, as a public company and as the company grows. But I would say, you know, that, you know, a lot of this depends on the, the specific circumstances. What, what I will also say is that historically, you know, in, in terms of the companies that we work with, which are, you know, very much focused on technology, emerging growth company, energy uh, companies, that the, the, the SPAC sponsors have been heavily you know, East Coast finance related. I think that you're seeing some of that change. You're seeing some um, more SPAC sponsors from the type of industries that I described um, that, that we work with, with, you know, what are 
you know, target companies or operating companies, you know, probably a, a better description of as part of, of this process. And it will be interesting to see because I think some of those um, SPAC sponsors, you know, have a different view of how they would like to have their relationship be with the companies that, that they partner with. Although, you know, there are plenty of, of organizations out there that you know have had great success with SPAC transactions and look to do one and then look to do the next one. And there's nothing wrong with that. You could have a you know very successful transaction and a very successful public company afterwards. And the sponsor can move on and, 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 and do that again um, in, in either a different industry or with a different company with a different SPAC going forward. So I, I don't think that there's a one size fits all answer here. And you know one of the things that I, I would say and I do you know a fair amount of of you know, what I will call traditional I, IPOs, I think that they're, and each IPO is, is specific to the company as well. I don't, I don't want to overstate that traditional IPOs um, you know, have certain characteristics that, that aren't you know, specific to the company going public. But with SPAC transactions, I'm finding that you know, there's just a lot more variety in where the operating company sits, who the sponsors are, you know, there's even provisions within the structure of the transaction without getting into the economics of, of, of the SPAC sponsors and how that might relate to the operating company. But things like lockup agreements, um, you know, in the traditional IPO sense, you know, with some exceptions in, in, in terms of it, it's, fair, it's been fairly standard for, you know, a long period of time what those look like. In the SPAC transactions, you have a, a great ability to have more bespoke arrangements. That doesn't mean that you can't have the default lockup arrangements that you see in a traditional IPO, but those are the type of things that we're spending a lot of time with, with companies um, and SPAC sponsors as, as you negotiate an LOI, you negotiate the terms of the, the merger agreement. And we're finding, at least I'm finding, that, that a lot of it is really specific to the specific circumstances of, of the operating company and the SPAC at the time they're doing the transaction. Yeah, and I think that's we got a, we have a number of questions in the Q and A here as well on um, how do targets find sponsors? And so, so Sherry, I might give this one to you. Um, you know, in a traditional IPO, you know, companies go out and they would run a bake off across banks, and if they can find an underwriter, then they would pursue on and, and execute an IPO. Um, are companies going out and approaching SPACs about merging with them? Are the SPACs approaching companies? You know, how do you see that happening in most of the transactions that, that you work on? Yeah, so it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, certainly, you know, SPACs are looking at a number of targets out there. And it could be targets they've been looking at, you know, for several months, even years, even in advance of thinking of a, a SPAC transaction you know, in and of its own. Um, and so we're certainly seeing it being approached that way. And where, you know, KPMG's deal advisory team participates in that is, you know, we might be involved in doing diligence on the target with the sponsor, or we might bring, you know, companies that we've looked at to SPAC sponsors and, you know, investors that we've worked with in the past. But similarly, you know, on the flip side, the targets can, can do the same. So if you think about they're on the sell side and they're interested in being acquired by our SPAC, they can actually you know, reach out to investors that maybe they've, you know, worked with in the past or work through a firm that's got those contacts and basically, you know, bring themselves to the, the SPAC sponsor as a potential, you know, acquisition target. So we've seen it happen both ways and basically, you know, it's, it's marketing and it's getting out there and letting it be known sort of what your, your story is and, you know, where the synergies might be. So um, it's been interesting to see that go, you know, on both sides. And Priya, we've got an interesting question here about what jurisdictions are used for, for the SPACs. Um, is that going to affect anything from the, the risk profile? Are they generally Delaware corporations or are there other uh, structures that people are using? Um, so broadly, domestic versus um, not non-domestic or foreign. Um, I will say that if you are a um, Cayman SPAC with a U.S. address, um, I, I'm not actually sure what the end result will be for litigation, but you can at least get insurance typically from a U.S. domestic carrier. Those numbers I, I gave are all U.S. domestic. Um, in my experience, and we have a lot of experience with this, 
a, uh, let's say a Singapore organized SPAC or some SPAC that is organized outside of the US, um, all bets are off on the numbers for that. And that's partly due to the almost complete collapse of the London market. So um, just as a, as a opening observation, the um, ability to get insurance for a non-domestic SPAC, a foreign SPAC is much, much harder than it is and much more expensive than it is for a, a US SPAC. A lot of the ones that we, we see are either Cayman or they'll be kind of typical Delaware. For both of those, even for Cayman, we strongly recommend including something called a federal choice of forum provision in the um, certificate of incorporation. The idea there is that if there is going to be litigation against the SPAC, we wanna make sure that shows up in US federal court and not elsewhere. That should work in the US for a Delaware um, company because of the series of um, cases that have taken place recently. No idea if it works for a Cayman organized as in my example SPAC, but we sure hope it will um, because having multi-front litigation is, uh, is really expensive and difficult. And so our recommendation is just go ahead and put it in in case that would be helpful. Um, we, we really are hoping it will be helpful. And Mark, we're getting a couple of questions. We'd mentioned a couple of times some of the motivation of the sponsors of the SPAC. Uh, I thought it might be helpful maybe for the audience, we could walk through kind of the typical structure of a SPAC uh, in terms of how they come to market. You know, maybe you could cover a little bit about what's encompassed in the typical unit in terms of shares and warrants, and then how to think about the um, incentives around the sponsors. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. And, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, we work mostly on the with the operating companies, although I've, I've become more familiar with the economics of, of the SPAC sponsors uh, as we've you know, been counseling a number of companies through this this process. You know, at, at a high level, uh, the units in, in the SPAC are, are, are combined uh, shares in, in warrants and um, they're, they're sold at ten dollars a, a share. The the SPAC sponsor has has upside in that they have an equity interest in in the SPAC that they buy at a, a nominal price, and that's basically for twenty five percent of the the SPAC. So you can see, you know, just the tremendous amount of economic upside a SPAC sponsor has, and this has be, become a, a source of negotiation. Uh, with operating companies as they've been able to uh, evaluate uh, different potential uh, SPAC companies to, to potentially pursue business combinations with and negotiate some of the economics with the, the SPAC sponsors. You're, you're also seeing the situation where one, one of the things historically that has made SPAC transactions um, somewhat uncertain for, for companies in, in the emerging growth space is the ability of the SPAC stockholders to redeem um, their, their shares if they don't think that the business combination is, is compelling. But the warrant um, aspect of it gives them potential upside even if they um, redeem their, their shares. And so in, in the situation that I'm uh, seeing the, these days where there is a combined pipe transaction together with uh, the business combination uh, transaction, oftentimes the, the minimum amount of proceeds between the pipe transaction and the SPAC transaction uh, upon completion of the merger is met very early on, really locked in at the time that the, the merger agreement is announced together with the pipe transaction. Um, and then if for whatever reason, the, the, there are redemptions, uh, which hopefully the, the pipe investment makes it less likely that there will be a number of redemptions. Some of that's subject to how the stock performs uh, after the deal is announced. Uh, the deal still go through because the, the stockholders who redeem uh, still have an, an, an interest in the company being successful. And so when we think about you know, those type of issues, the economics uh, for both the SPAC sponsors and, and the SPAC investors, you know, are very different than what we see in traditional IPOs. Can I add something about um, the compensation structure for the sponsors? Uh, so, of course, right, let's take the, the absolutely true view that the sponsors are the ones who put up the first capital, they're the ones that are doing all the work, all of that is true. Um, right now, there seems to be a ever widening spectrum of what's the payoff 
for the additional the initial um, work and investment capital of the sponsor. From an insurance um, perspective, to the extent that someone is organizing a SPAC and the arrangement is, is richer than what the market would otherwise suggest is appropriate, you will absolutely have a problem getting insurance. Your insurance will be more expensive. Um, and it's not, that's not a surprise, right? Carriers are a little bit worried about what does this mean? Um, and so, for example, if the structure is unusually rich, if the um, arrangement also includes outsized cash payments to um, the people, you know, the, the people doing the work of searching for the target, those are the kinds of things that, of course, need to be disclosed, will be disclosed, but certainly raise an eyebrow. Um, and that's not just insurance carriers, um, you know, being sullen about a situation. If you look at the M&A litigation that we've seen, the really bad ones will involve two factors. And one is the deal closed right at the end of the SPAC's timeline, which can suggest that it was fast. Um, but the other thing is that the allegations of this being an improper transaction will focus heavily on the fact that the sponsors achieved big upside if the deal closed and nothing if the deal did not. And so what, what is actually a very straightforward, well-disclosed economic arrangement at the time of the SPAC IPO, um, you know, with some squinting and some bad facts, actually looks like a conflict or is being characterized, I should say, as a conflict at the end. Um, and so as folks are thinking about those arrangements and how lucrative they are, it may be worth taking a beat and considering what does it look like um, to a judge or to a third party if, in fact, you have a difficult transaction right at the end of the timeline. Yeah, and Priya, maybe I, I can just add one thing about the, the SPAC um, economics as well. And I think that you're right to point out some of the the risks um, that, that you're seeing from an insurance side and, and, and also from you know, a conflict or a, a plaintiff's bar side. But you know, just as I mentioned that you know, operating companies are often um, situated differently and this is creating you know, kind of a, a, a wide spectrum of, of companies that are considering uh, doing the de spacking transaction. I would say that as as Jeff was showing at the beginning with the graph and the sheer numbers of, of SPAC transactions, you are seeing different participants uh, on the SPAC sponsor side take different approaches to the economics. So there are some you know, bespoke um, warrant um, structures that, that aren't uh, you know, just at $10 a share. There are some differing approaches to the, the, the sponsor fees. And I think some of that is an effort to be competitive. I think some of it is, is an effort uh, on, on the part of some SPAC sponsors about who they're going to, to partner with and signaling uh, that it's a long-term partnership as opposed to you know, a, a financial transaction as well. And, and, and there is a lot of differences in, in, in the market. One thing uh, that Sherry addressed in, um, earlier was you know, how you find the, the right SPAC sponsor or, or how the SPAC sponsor finds a company. And I, I think that the, the investment banks, and you don't have to use an invest, investment bank necessarily for this, but investment banks can have, you know, add tremendous value in navigating um, this environment, uh, especially for an operating company that isn't, you know, focused on understanding uh, the SPAC market, who the, who the folks are, what SPACs are coming, you know, online in terms of going to be, you know, making filings, understanding the, you know, where they are in the life cycle and, and some of the dynamics, the relationships that SPACs, you know, may have with the, the pipe investors. Um, and, and, and so there are advisors who, who know these areas well that can help a company navigate, you know, pretty important issues in, in, in terms of how um, a, a transaction like this is not only structured, but it is executed with an eye towards having a, a successful company on the other side of the transaction. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the interesting things we've been seeing with a number of the, the SPACs that have been coming to market lately. As you mentioned, Mark, you know, different structures around the warrants, potentially some without warrants, different uh, approaches on the promote, as it's called. Um, and I don't think it's, it's that dissimilar to some of the evolutions we saw in the venture capital industry over the past decade. 
So before, you know, I think the VCs, you know, if you go back 10, 20 years, got much richer terms um, in terms of things like liquidation preference and uh, the like. And then, you know, when you saw um, VCs come out with a founder friendly model and different structures, as there was more cash going into that asset class, uh, you saw the VCs having to get a little bit more com competitive in the ways that they're approaching companies. I think you're seeing the same thing with the SPAC sponsors now. And so like any market, as you see more cash flow into a, a certain asset class, you do start to see the, uh, the pricing get adjusted, if you will, in terms of the cost of capital. Well, sure, I'd like to take the conversation back a little bit more to, um, you know, we've kind of gone through the way these SPACs are formed, some of the considerations for the sponsors. Once you get into the operational aspect of you're going through the transaction, you know, once the business uh, combination is complete, you are a public company. And so, you know, how do you think about things like making sure you're relevant for things like Sarbanes-Oxley uh, and the SOX requirements that come with being a public company and closing the quarter on time? How should companies be thinking about making those investments as they're working through what's a pretty frantic merger process? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's not a lot of time for things outside of the merger process itself, um, but certainly, you know, not to underestimate that that's going to, some of those requirements are going to hit fairly quickly. So, you know, I think from a regulatory reporting requirements, once the company is public, key things to keep in mind is, you know, the timeline is going to be very different. So if you think about quarterly reporting requirements, it's a 45 day window from the end of the quarter. And that can be pretty onerous for companies because it's not only, you know, closing the books, hopefully in under 10 days, um, but then getting through all the reporting, going through a review with the audit team, getting through audit committee um, approvals, et cetera, you know, prior to filing. So, you know, that timeline um, is not to be underestimated. And so you really need to think about what can you automate so that it's not a manual process what resources can you hire to help beef up your accounting function? And what can you really do to accelerate? Um, so that's one of the first tasks that needs to be addressed, I think, because you know, one of the cardinal sins is missing a reporting deadline as a public company. So the SEC doesn't take too kindly to that. Um, so certainly something, you know, one of the key focus areas, as soon as you can put sort of the, the merger itself, you know, in the in the rear window, that's you know one of the top priorities. And then you mentioned SOC. So there's a number of requirements and timelines to be aware of. So um, the SOC timeline will be dictated, you know, by, by the SPAC, you know, when they actually became public, um, because you have, you know, a two 10Ks basically um, to become SOCs compliant. And there's two pieces to that. There's management has to do, you know, its attestation around the control environment. And then there may also be an audit requirement. So if we just focus on what management's responsibilities are, um, it could be within you know, a year to you know, less than two years um, at the outset to be compliant with SOC 404. And so it's never too early to start thinking about that process because it can be quite a journey from identifying what the key processes and controls are actually documenting what they are and then having a testing protocol in place. Um, so, you know, if it's, if it's a one year window, that's absolutely the time frame to be focused on. If you have more time than that, you know, based on the SPACs timeline, that's certainly to, to be taken advantage of. But I also don't want to forget about, there is a quarterly SOX requirement that companies have to be aware of. Um, so SOX 302 and 906 from a, a you know, telling you what part of the act to be aware of. But this is all around disclosure controls and procedures. And so CEO and CFO have to certify on those controls you know, in the 10Q um, on a quarterly basis. And so you don't have time <laughs> to start to prepare for that. That's something, again, you know, just like closing the quarter and reporting to the SEC, that timeline hits fairly quickly as well. So I would say you know, those areas are a high priority. Um, to focus on as soon as there's a moment to breathe. And Mark, there's also some uh, governance requirements that come into play as a public company. Uh, NASDAQ, as well as the New York Stock Exchange has requirements for things like uh, independent board members. Can you walk us through uh, some of the timelines and thoughts on that and when companies should get going? Yeah, no, um, and, and, and when, when I think about this, I, I think about what we mentioned earlier about 
uh, the preparation to be a public company and that usually when you're going public through a traditional IPO, you're giving a fair amount of thought uh, to these issues leading up to kicking off uh, the IPO process. You're thinking about who your board members are. Uh, you're, you're thinking about you know, diversity issues, at, at, at least for California-based companies and, and the laws that, that, that apply to them. Um, you're, you're, you're thinking about you know, the investment in GNA uh, th that I mentioned. Uh, you know, a number of the companies that we're working with really haven't had that on their radar screen highly or, or, or if at all. And, and so we're working with a number of companies that are having to, you know, to think about these issues, you know, while they're, you know, driving the proverbial car through the SPAC process. And that might be adding board members as, as you go. Um, one of the, 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 the key, you know, positions on a board is who the audit committee uh, chairperson is um, in terms of being, you know, a financial expert, somebody, uh, not not only who meets the the rule requirements of, of NASDAQ or the NYSE, but you know somebody that you know the the company and the investors have have confidence, in, and, and also uh, the audit firm ha, ha, has confidence in because there's a, a really important relationship there. Um, you know there's some phase in rules uh, that both NASDAQ and, and the NYSE have. Um, I, I think that. You know, it's a bit of an overstatement, but generally, um, when you go th public through a traditional IPO, uh, even though you can avail yourself of some of the phase and rules, uh, most companies try to be compliant from from day one. There are certainly exceptions to that. I, I think in the in the SPAC transaction world, one of the interesting things, you know, about this is that the company's already listed. And, and, and so some of those those time periods, you, you really have to think about, you know, when the phase and rules kick in, um, which is very different than, you know, necessarily when, when the IPO is concluded in the traditional IPO uh, process. So the, the companies that we're working with are, you know, thinking about all these uh, governance issues and, and, and that involves, you know, the sometimes the establishment of, of various committees. So you have the audit committee and the compensation committee and, and the nominating and governance committee. Who's gonna serve on those committees? Do we have enough independent directors to constitute a majority of the board? And I'm gonna put aside issues such as, you know, control company exceptions um, and, and, and the like. And then on top of it, you have an, an employee base um, that, you know, might not be fully uh, ready to, to be a public company. Oftentimes as companies gear up to be public, they begin to put processes in place that look a lot more like public companies. The information uh, from a financial perspective isn't necessarily shared as widely um, as, as it might've been when a company was at an earlier stage. And so, you know, things like insider trading, uh, compliance programs, uh, whistleblower hotlines, those type of things. Uh, we're also helping companies uh, put those in place kind of on the fly. And one of the things that you have to think about with that is um, educational sessions for um, for the employee base, for the management team, uh, frankly, for the board of, of directors as well. Um, you know, a number of our companies um, are, are venture-backed companies or, or private equity-backed companies. And, you know, the, the focus, you know, in the boardroom, you know, changes when you have public company stockholders and you have uh, a uh, a plaintiff's bar that is looking at, uh, at everything that comes out of the company, in particular, the, the operating results. And there's, um, you know, a, a not insignificant educational uh, ramp um, to, to, this entire, to this entire process. On top of that, uh, you, you wind up having um, employee benefit uh, considerations that, you know, weren't really on the radar screen before, such as um, employee stock purchase uh, programs, which are very uh, common for technology and emerging growth companies and can be a tremendous benefit. And without getting into the technicalities and the mechanics of how those are, are put in place, you have to give thought to that. You have, um, you know, management compensation that is all of a sudden uh, public. And these companies might not have to do the full CDNA in initially, but they have to do, you know, executive compensation that is going to be publicly disclosed both as part of the proxies and, and S4 process. And then as part of being a public company, and soon enough, uh, there will be full-blown CDNA. So, thinking about compensation from that perspective, director compensation, 
there's all of that. And it, it seems like it's going at, at 100 miles an hour because the focus initially is often on making sure that the pipe um, investment side of this get, gets locked in. But then it quickly shifts over to some of these more mechanical matters, but really important for setting up a company well uh, from a governance perspective and a reporting perspective uh, once the transaction is concluded. And Sherry, you had mentioned before, you know, a lot of private company compensation plans are not uh, structured appropriately. It kind of depends who's doing the acquiring. Is the target acquiring the SPAC or vice versa? Um, you know, then a lot of companies here in the Bay Area use, you know, restricted stock units, which often are, are triggered on liquidation events. You know, maybe those plans didn't contemplate a, a SPAC business combination as one of those exit events, depending on the structure. You know, is there anything companies can be doing now on their executive, on their uh, compensation structures to kind of deal with that, uh, to make sure they're ready for the different outcomes? Yeah, I mean, certainly reviewing contracts and looking through what are the change of control clauses, um, because that tends to be one of the issues that takes up a lot of time when a company is actually in the merger transaction is making sure that those ramifications have been properly evaluated and properly accounted for. So. And it's easier to modify agreements before you're in the public company domain and to the extent that you know you can review those contracts with your legal advisors, your accounting, your tax advisors, and maybe do some restructuring you know prior to a transaction. It's always hard to anticipate sort of when it's going to happen and if it's going to happen. but it is prudent to at least you know do that sort of corporate review and see if there are any clauses that you'd want to change. It's definitely easier to do that as a private company than what you're in the public company domain. So it's well worth the effort. And, you know, aside of that, the accounting implications of it can be quite, you know, challenging. And so taking the time to really vet that, um, work that out with your auditor or your advisor is certainly something that can help accelerate the timeline as well. I know there's a lot of competing priorities, but, uh, these all hit at the same time once you're in the middle of a transaction. And Priya, one other good question that came in here was um, around the, the role of the director for the actual SPAC itself. So what, what's the right way to think about directors on a SPAC? What's their role? What are their responsibilities? And, and how are the, those boards typically structured? Oh, great question. And the, the, the role of the board is actually um, comfortingly consistent. It is always maximizing returns for shareholders. I'm putting asterisks on our uh, latest efforts on stakeholder capitalism, but as a general rule, um, and I'm really thinking about the independent directors that get impaneled on the board of a SPAC as it's going public, um, their job is to make sure that a good process was followed for the DSPAC transaction. You know, that's the entire show. And so when a, when a group is thinking about who should be on the SPAC board, you know, all you have is the talent in the room. And so presumably the actual SPAC sponsors, the ones who are doing the work are going to have some expertise in the industry that you're targeting, um, have some public company experience since that's the end goal here. The independent directors, you actually want to see a, a nice diversity of experience that will include exactly what we just talked about. Do they know something about the industry we're talking about? Do they have public company experience? And there's also room for people that just know about M&A, know about corporate governance, can help with those kinds of aspects, particularly because your SPAC may be the, it may end up, you don't necessarily know at the beginning, you may end up being uh, the kind of SPAC where you've got a number of people that end up going on the board of the operating company. In the beginning, um, board, meetings will look more like M&A review sessions. And that's appropriate because of course, that's all the SPAC is doing. Um, and if you are in our audience today thinking about going on the board of, of the SPAC, one of the things you wanna think about is what is the, um, is there a platform perhaps that the sponsors have that will make your job as a board member easier? So as an example, um, if you are, if you're going on the board of a SPAC that's really a private equity vehicle, those tend to come with a high degree of sophistication in the M&A platform that will be available to you and will be part of your review process. 
Um, you, however, may be an independent board member that has a ton of M&A experience and is comfortable um, with less formal structure as long as you have a lot of um, faith and knowledge about the sponsor group. And so maybe you don't need that platform, um, but that's the role, that's the job. And when you look at the end state where things go poorly, it's always the case that the plaintiffs, one of their complaints will be that the board didn't do a good review. You know, and didn't, as a quick reminder, the rule isn't that the M&A process has, has to have gone off flawlessly. The rule is that the board has to have tried, and I certainly encourage you to create a record that makes it easy to show that you tried to do a good job. So Mark, we're still getting a couple of questions on kind of the, the deal structure and some of the different um, incentives, right? So uh, the, the units are issued, you know, there's some warrants potentially out there, the, the sponsors have their promote. Let's talk a little bit about the pipe and the idea of raising some additional capital ahead of the business combination to fund potentially a larger acquisition than what this SPAC was set up for. How do you think about the interests of the investors in the pipe versus those of the SPAC? Well, the, the pipe investors don't have the, the warrant e economics. And for that matter, they don't have the sponsor economics either. And so they are you know, really investing at that $10 a share price. And so their upside is in the company performing well. And part of it will be the announcement of the deal. Um, and then part of it will be how the company performs um, you know, after the business combination transaction is complete. They're they're not able to 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 trade in the stock that they buy um, through the pipe investment until the registration statement um, for for the shares that they bought are, are put up after the business combination transaction is done. So you know it, it, it is a not insignificant time period. Um, you know, meaning you know it, it's at least a few months before those shares are are registered and able to be freely tradable. Um, you know, so it's a very, you know, different type of investment than the SPAC investors make or the sponsors for the, the SPAC uh, to make. You know, from my perspective um, in, in, in looking at these transactions, and, and, and I think a little bit uh, to the time in, in kind of the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, when, you know, there were a number of companies that were going public that were more at a development stage uh, status is probably the best way to describe it, as opposed to the companies going public uh, through, through traditional IPOs or direct listings today, which are huge companies with you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in annual recurring revenue, uh, if not profitable, then approaching profitability. A number of the companies uh, that we're seeing go through the, the SPAC process and attract significant pipe investment are, are at these earlier stages. They might not all be pre-revenue. Um, they, there's certainly an appetite in the market for some revenue uh, companies that are going through the SPAC process. Um, but you know, to, to me, you know, that, that is kind of the interesting development in this last year or, or, or so, just seeing the willingness of, of, of investors that traditionally uh, invest in public companies through public offerings or otherwise, uh, participating in these transactions and basically uh, adding deal certainty at a much earlier point than you have with, with an IPO or a traditional IPO. And in a traditional IPO, you don't price the IPO until the very end of the transaction. Um, in, in a pipe or in a SPAC transaction with the pipe, you're, you're you know, locking in valuation, um, you know, probably four to six weeks going back to our initial conversation after the, the SPAC LOI is signed up. And you know, during that process um, of, of going out to the pipe investors and figuring out you know, what the right kind of combined number between the pipe uh, investment and the, and the SPAC investment is, you, know, you can see a little bit of rejiggering of, of, of the economics potentially during that time. At least at the front end is the type of thing that people um, trade off on in, in, in terms of what the mix of, uh, you know, it is between the, the pipe investment and the SPAC investment, you know, ultimately the company will have to have a story about how it's going to use the money that comes in, you know, on a combined basis through the, the SPAC and, and, and the pipe. But, but the pipe investment is, you know, a very different animal than, than the SPAC investment, both uh, from an investor standpoint and from a sponsor standpoint. Mm 
Super helpful. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it just gets to all of those kind of competing interests uh, around the, uh, the, the market. And on that front, we just got a really interesting question and um, thinking specifically about kind of venture backed companies, right? And I know you deal with us a lot on, you know, hey, if, the, if a venture backed company is going through an acquisition, the VCs on the board obviously have a financial interest and then they're supposed to act as a, a you know, represent their interest on the board. So what are some of the different nuances when you think about the target company's board's responsibilities as they're evaluating the different alternatives of, yeah. you know, traditional acquisition, IPO, or SPAC? Absolutely. Um, so first and foremost, if I could, I'd like to hand out cookies and the cookies should say, um, no matter who puts you on the board, you represent the common. I realize that would be a large cookie. But the reason I'm bringing it up is that it would be very useful if everybody could just keep that in mind. Um, one of the um, really interesting conversations that I have on a serial basis goes something like this. Um, well, I represent the preferred and I have a fiduciary duty to them. And so there's like a blended fiduciary duty isn't there between the common and that's not a thing. Um, it's nice, it's a fun idea, but there is no such thing as a blended fiduciary duty standard. Um, so sorry to disappoint, the law is super clear on this point. Um, and that creates a problem that folks should think about proactively. Um, so for any target, um, you all, the board, no matter how you got on that board, no matter who you think you represent, has to think in terms of what's best for the common stockholders and will absolutely um, need to have a record of having done so. Okay, so now let's get to reality where I, you know, I don't actually give out massive cookies. And the reality is all too often, we are gonna have a board that has shareholders that are, sorry, that has um, board members that have different incentives because they actually represent different classes of preferred. You know, in the best case, they will have thought about this ahead of time and they will have impaneled couple independent board members because ideally you will form a special committee and that special committee will be in charge of the up or down vote on MA. And doing that, having that uh, structure in place can save a lot of time, um, aggravation, as well as litigation costs if the deal is challenged. Um, if you can't do that, and it's going to be really difficult at go time to say to everybody, hey, stop, notwithstanding our awesome deal, let's take the time to throw some governance in here and, and panel independent directors, that's just not reality. And so what you're going to end up doing is having a lot of good documentation, a lot of good work about the actual fairness of the deal to your shareholders, because if there is a challenge by the shareholders of the target that just sold themselves, there will be the standard of review is something called entire fairness. Um, we sure hope we don't get there because again, there's just a lot of litigation that's associated with it. Um, so the takeaway is have process as the target. You, know, you don't just take one deal and say, sounds good, wrap it up. And nobody who's attending this webinar would be thinking in those terms. Um, but I think the clarifying point is ideally you do have uh, a special committee of the board that's comprised of independents and if not, you're just going into the transaction knowing that you may be challenged. I do wanna point out that not all challenges are equally situated. Um, so some are just kind of stupid and will go away for small amounts of money, you know, limitless fee, something like that. Um, some are much more serious and serious tracks um, the amount of money and potentially the amount of disappointment that may be being experienced by various um, people in the mix. Um, which gets me to another thought, which is when the buyer is doing diligence on this target, one of the things the target is going to want to think about is something like reps and warranties insurance. The buyer should think about it too. Um, that is an insurance product. It's not DNO, it's a deal specific type of insurance, and it exists to cabin um, the, the problem that may exist in the actual reps and warranties of the deal. So when you think about what happens in M&A transactions, there can be a challenge around just the price. And we just talked about that. There's often post-transaction a challenge around who knew what when, because not all these deals work out super well. And so the board, and we see, we've seen a couple of cases like this in SPAC world, the board that's doing the buying 
if they don't want to have a problem about the diligence that they did, it really helps if they put in place a reps and warranties policy so that if there is a problem, instead of having the economics of the whole thing fall apart, you actually hedged your benefit by putting in place this policy that can pay out if in fact there's a bit of a problem in the diligence of the deal. Um, so I'm hopeful that those you know, couple specific action oriented um, recommendations will be helpful. That reps and warranties policy concept is well known. PE firms particularly know it very well. And we've, but we've seen very uneven adoption um, when it comes to SPAC transactions, both the target and the acquirer it's worth at least looking at it because in the right circumstance, it is, it is very much worth the money you spent when you think about how it protects um, the transaction and protects the economics of the transaction. Awesome. Well, I know we're uh, almost coming up on time here and I want to make sure we leave time for my, my last and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, the most fun question of the day, but I want to give each of you a chance to kind of give your prediction for 2021 in terms of what are we going to see, whether it's on uh, the SPAC IPO front or what we'll see in terms of trends on the, the business combinations in the back end. Uh, so Mark, I'll, I'll kick off with you. What are your uh, sage predictions for next year? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of things I wouldn't have predicted when we started 2020 and uh, SPACs are, are, are certainly one of them, but not the highest thing that surprised me this year. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've been asked this question a, a fair amount, and I would be the last person to tell you that I have a, a, a crystal ball um, as, as to where things are going. I mean, there's been a number of factors since the shelter in place orders um, came down at, in, in, mid, in mid March that have affected uh, the capital markets. Um, you know, we, we have been you know, much busier than anybody would have had a reasonable expectation to, to be. Uh, th this year, especially on our capital markets um, side, uh, whether that be traditional IPOs or convertible debt offerings, which we saw at you know really unprecedented levels in the April, May, and in, in June timeframes, and 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 then the development of the SPAC market, uh, the, the you know going back to the first slide that that you showed has been remarkable. And you know, I personally think some of this is going to depend on um, the willingness of the, the pipe investors to play such an active role at, at, as they are, and whether they're uh, going to continue to have money flow into you know more development stage companies, pre-revenue or or revenue based uh, or, or revenue generating companies. Um, you know what what I've seen you know so far at the end of of, of this year augurs well for this continuing. Going forward, and I, I personally think that it, it would be a tremendous development if there were more uh, avenues for companies to to become public companies and to you know raise capital um, either through a business combination transaction or, or or otherwise. We've had a you know relative dearth of of IPOs uh, in the U.S. public markets. You know, going really going back to the you know the bust of the the dot com boom and the implementation of of Sarbanes Oxley, and I, I mentioned before just how high a bar it is to you know be a private company and to be able to contemplate doing a direct listing or a traditional IPO. You know we're lucky in that you know there are a number of wonderful companies out there that uh, approach that, but there's a lot you know a, a large number a larger number of companies who aren't quite there yet, and having you know additional means to to raise capital. Uh, I think would be, you know, a, a good thing. And then, you know, pure number of, of public companies in the United States has gone down uh, over, over the decades, not, not up. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm hopeful, um, you know, that, you know, I, I did make a joke when we were doing one of the preparatory sessions uh, for this panel discussion is that if, you told me six months ago we'd be having a panel discussion about SPACs. I wouldn't have believed you, uh, but I certainly hope we're having another one in, in six months from now. Fantastic. Sherry, what do you see coming up in 21? Yeah, well, you know, what I think is interesting to hear is just how popular the spec, you know, market and transactions have been in 2020. And some people are like, you know, what is this new, new vehicle that we're seeing? And it's really not new, right? It's been around for decades, um, but it comes and goes in favor. And I think, you know, the volatility that we, we've seen in 2020 has been a contributing factor to the popularity in SPACs and that 
there's a little more certainty around the economics than in a traditional IPO path. And I don't see that volatility um, subsiding anytime soon in 2021. So I expect to see, you know, what we've seen in 2020 to, to continue. Um, I do think there's a lot of competition out there. There's, a, you know, four targets for good targets. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's speed to market that tends to be a big driver. Um, so, you know, I think we'll continue to see um, a significant amount of SPAC activity, but I think it'll be more and more difficult for investors to, to find the, the targets that they're looking for. And Priya? Um, so I'm gonna say something that will sound super negative, but bear with me because it ends up in a good place. So the super negative part is more SPACs will lead to more litigation. That's how it works. Um, you can't have this number of people um, chasing this amount of money and somehow not have folks stub their toe if not completely full on yard sale along the way. And that's unfortunate in that the negative press associated with a few bad actors will cause problems in the industry. And, and that's, that's a real bummer. I'm, I'm, that bums me out. The other thing is we will continue, at least in my world, to have um, CFOs and others be surprised, nay shocked at the cost of insurance. And that will not end until people start getting proactive about, hey, this is a real expense. We should know what it costs um, and understanding that that's dynamic. The good news, though, is like for so many things, the stress in the system has the capacity to squeeze out people who really should not have been doing this stuff to start. And we saw that in IPO world. Um, you know, we've seen several bubbles around that, and that's kind of what happens. So um, my view is that there's a lot of activity right now, both by people who are going to learn and do very well, as well as by people who are going to end up falling off by the sidelines. Um, but like most things, when they're new, the survivors will have learned a lot. And I think that will end up in the end bolstering the maturity of SPACs as a, as a really viable path to going public and as a fundraising vehicle. And when I think macro level for the United States and our economy, that is a great thing. Awesome. Well, my bold prediction is that we're going to continue to see evolution on the ways companies can go to market in the U.S., and that's going to lead to a ton more educational sessions here at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center to keep uh, founders and entrepreneurs uh, on the cutting edge of all the changes. So please, everyone, join me in thanking Mark, Sherry, and Priya for their insights today. I hope you all found it insightful, and we look forward to seeing you on our next uh, session. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.